for another episode of our Rational Wellness Podcast. It's confusing to know what you're supposed to do to be healthy. What should we be eating? How should we be exercising? Um, should we be avoiding red meat, um, cheese, and butter? Should we be putting butter in our coffee? How should we be exercising? Should we be taking calcium supplements or are calcium supplements harmful? Should we take fish oil? Is fish oil harmful? My goal is to bring clarity to some of these issues using the top scientific research and interviewing experts in the field who can help us understand some of these issues. Please subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. So let's get started on your road to better health. The hope was so enticing back in the day. Hey, Rational Wellness Podcasters, thank you for joining us again today. And we have a very exciting topic. We're going to talk about probiotics and the benefits that can be derived from taking the correct probiotic strain for the proper usage. Most people in the United States and most functional medicine practitioners especially know that taking probiotics can be extremely helpful for our health. But there's so much confusion about which probiotic is the most beneficial, and especially when dealing with specific health issues, such as uh, um, IBS or, or inflammatory bowel disease or various digestive disorders, you know, which probiotic is really going to be beneficial for us? Is it just a question of how many billion uh, organisms we take, um, et cetera? Um, healthy bacteria and fungi, also known as probiotics, inhabit our body, including our skin, in our mouths, in the vagina, and most importantly, in our digestive tracts, especially in our colon. These healthy critters are crucial for our health. And when these bacteria are out of balance or deficient, as a result of poor diet, an unhealthy lifestyle, taking antibiotics, or a series of other medications that damage our bacteria, or even just being exposed to pesticides and antiseptics, for example, just like the chlorine found in drinking water, um, taking probiotic and prebiotic supplements and eating fermented foods can all be beneficial in helping to restore our normal bacteria flora. But in order to help figure out which probiotic might be best to take in particular cases, I, I've asked our special guest, Dr. Jason Harrelick to join us. I'm so excited that Dr. Harrelick is joining us today. He is a researcher, lecturer, naturopath, and nutritionist with over 17 years of experience. And he practices at Gould's Natural Medicine, a 136-year-old natural medicine apothecary and clinic in Hobart, Tasmania, Australia. Dr. Harrelick completed his PhD examining the capacity of probiotics, prebiotics, and herbal medicines to modify the gastrointestinal tract microbiota. He's currently the senior lecturer in complementary and alternative medicines at the University of Tasmania School of Medicine, where he coordinates the evidence-based complementary medicine program. Dr. Harrelick also teaches the gastrointestinal imbalances unit within the Masters of Science in Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine Program at the University of Western States in Portland, Oregon. He's on the Medical Nutrition Council of the American Society for Nutrition, and he's a fellow of both the Naturopaths and the Herbalists Association of Australia and the American College of Nutrition. Dr. Harrelick has developed an incredible database of information about probiotics called the Probiotic Advisor to help practitioners differentiate which probiotic strains and products are appropriate for different conditions. I highly recommend you check it out and subscribe because it's an incredible valuable resource for a, a, a very reasonable cost. Dr. Harrelick, thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> oh, thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Okay, I guess we have a little oh, bit of delay. Thank you for I guess all those words too. <laughs> when, when the uh, internet signal travels from the United States uh, under the oceans to Australia. Yeah, I think it's probably like 
twelve thousand miles or something like that. So yeah, it's a long. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know kilometers better, but I think it's around that. So it's a long okay. distance. So I guess we'll have to think of ourselves as watching one of those newscasts where we're talking to a, a newscaster on the other side of the world. So Dr. Harrell, to start with, can you explain how probiotics can potentially help us restore a healthy balance of bacteria in our colon and digestive tracts? Okay, now that, that's a very good question. And, and I think, uh, um, in all honesty, I think that the role of probiotics is probably overstated um, in, in its capacity to, to, to do that. Now, I think that there's a, a very important role for probiotics after an acute insult, like antibiotic use or chemotherapy or radiotherapy, where you get some, a massive shift in the ecosystem, or even after proton pump inhibitors, which we know cause massive um, alterations in the ecosystem as well through their antibiotics antibiotic-like actions. Now, in those instances where, you know, you could imagine a, your, your normal ecosystem is like a, a very complete car park with every single parking space filled up. That's what it's supposed to look like. But post antibiotics or chemotherapy, et cetera, you end up having a lot of empty spaces in that car lot. Now, those empty spaces can be, can be taken up by, you know, potential pathogens that we happen to ingest at that, that time period, which is what can happen with clustering difficile, for example, when people are in a hospital setting, or, it can just be an overgrowth of bugs that are resistant to the antibiotics who will grow into the available space and obviously the more nutrients that are, that are available because there's a lack of competition. So probiotic can play a very important role in those instances of essentially coming in and taking up temporarily those, those parking places that would otherwise be taken up by potential pathogens. Now, I think the key thing to remember though is that, that all probiotics that we ingest as supplements or fermented foods are only temporary visitors to the gut so that they, you can't permanently reseed or re-inoculate with, with probiotics. And I think that's one of the biggest myths that, that persists all the way back from, from Metchnikoff's days. So Metchnikoff was the, the researcher who essentially discovered the bacteria that make milk into yogurt. You know, the whole reason why the whole world eats yogurt now is because of the research that he did. But his theory at that point is we could permanently inoculate our guts with this yogurt, the yogurt bacteria, and they would prevent protein putrefaction and slow down the aging process and keep us healthy. So that myth of, of permanent colonization of, from, from like an externally provided lactobacilli or gift bacteria persists to that, that, that time point, even though we now have 30 or 40 years of clinical trials showing that they're essentially temporary visitors um, in, in one's gut. And I, as I alluded to before, they're, they're very important for, to, to be taking during those acute insults, after those acute insults for, you know, I always suggest at least six weeks, but ideally three months. But I think an area that has actually uh, received far less attention than what it should in the, in the blogosphere and in practitioner land and, and the general public is, is essentially focusing on, on foods and, and, process and interventions that actually nourish your own indigenous populations and help them regrow after the insult. Because that, I think, is, is the key aspect of, of, of creating a healthy ecosystem is, is essentially feeding your, your indigenous populations and feeding the, the healthy members of the indigenous population specifically. And that would focus more on, on substances like prebiotics. And, you know, prebiotics, strictly speaking, are, are selectively ferment substrates and substances which, which feed a limited number of bacteria in your gut, which promote, which, which essentially result in, in improved health as well as a range of other dietary fibers, um, also known as colonic foods, or as the, um, the research couple at, at, at Stanford University called the Sonnenbergs who call the MAX, microbiota accessible carbohydrates. Um, I kind of like the term, but it reminds me too much of McDonald's, so it's never really grab <laughs> stayed with me. But I think the concept of, of essentially ingesting more fermentable substrates that actually feed our own indigenous populations is, is, is a missing factor now. We tend to be focusing a lot on fermented foods, but not so much on fermentable foods, but it's certainly fermentable foods that actually nourish our own indigenous populations to, to a greater degree. Now, essentially, these are carbohydrate foods, types of fiber that the bacteria eat. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So, so, so prebiotics in, in general are, are um, indigestible carbohydrates. And I think you're right. One of the key factors about a, a, a prebiotic is that it's got to be indigestible because there's a lot of bugs in your colon that would happily munch down on, on glucose, for example, but you don't get much <laughs> glucose reaching your colon because that gets absorbed avidly in the, in the upper, upper gut. So it's, so it's indigestible carbohydrates, which are things like you know, resistant starches, um, broadly speaking, 
you know, fiber, but we have insoluble fibers and soluble fibers of all different shapes and sizes, which feed different bugs, uh, pectins, um, mucilages, and oligosaccharides are examples of, of you know, indigestible um, carbs that essentially reach the colon where they feed your, your you know, butyrate producing microbes or, or bifidobacteria, for example. And, and the first thing that comes to my mind is that in the nutrition world right now, one of the biggest trends is trying to reduce your carbohydrates as much as possible. You know, we've gone from, you know, the higher carb, low fat diet now to the um, lower, lower carb, um, higher fat diet. And we've gone to paleo and now ketogenic. And then you've got practitioners out there saying like, you know, don't eat any grains, any beans. You can't even have uh, uh, um, uh, tomatoes. You can't have any, you know, any, any vegetables that have almost any carbohydrate content. And I wonder in this um, quest to try to improve our health by reducing carbohydrates, uh, we're probably going to leave out a lot of these crucial fibers found in carbohydrates that are really important for our overall health. Yes, I think you've got that spot on because, and, and you can easily assess this if you, if you start using, you know, um, modern molecular based uh, stool analyses that can actually tell you about the whole <clears throat> picture of the microbiota, not just, you know, four different species, but like a whole gamut. Um, and you start looking at the research that's looked at, at ketogenic diets, impact on the microbiota, or uh, high protein, low carb, is, is what you tend to see is, is a pretty similar pattern, is a, a reduction of. Of, of endogenous populations of bifidobacteria, reductions in butyrate producing bacteria in the gut. <clears throat> and when you look at the wonders of butyrate, that's not a good thing. You don't want to be reducing levels of butyrate producing bugs by 50% or 60% over, over, you know, for a long period of time because your, your overall health will suffer, but also your gut health will suffer too because compounds like butyrate and other short chain fatty acids, you know, your, your colon cells, 70% of their energy needs are met through short chain fatty acid production by bacteria in the gut. And by restricting fermentable substrates, we actually limit that. And, and essentially we end up limiting butyrate production and butyrate, amazing substance that re only reaches systemic circulation when you produce more than the colon cells can use as a, as a food source. So you've got to produce a lot of butyrate for it to reach systemic circulation. And that's where you get the benefit of it actually healing things like the blood brain barrier, um, improving insulin sensitivity, uh, improving neurotrophic growth factors in the brain. It's amazing substance, but you can only get that from essentially fermentation of, of fermentable substrates. And we know from looking at the research that the way most people and, and do those sorts of diets is we have a, a pretty massive reduction in butyrate producing bacteria and in bifidobacteria as well. Interesting. So I, I would like to say to those of you who are following a low carb diet, it's still possible to get that fiber. You just got to be really, really careful that the um, that it, outside of the, the fats and the protein that you're ingesting, that you're getting um, most of the rest of your calories from vegetables and, and other foods that include these types of fibers and, and not wasting those calories on, on just, you know, chunky um, sort of um, high fat foods. Um, you mentioned uh, butyrate. Yeah, what about and I, butyrate as a supplement? Not even, I don't even. What's that? No, it's, it's a good, sorry, it's a, the delay that, that involved there. I, mean, I was gonna say, I, I'd add to that too, that, that certainly there are, are times and places for, for, for such diets that can work in certain situations and for certain disease states. Now, I think what you have to do is, is be, be on to it, like you said, about dietary fiber, but I'd, I'd, I'd suggest actually supplementing additional dietary fiber like psyllium seeds ground up or psyllium husks, which we know enhance butyrate production, but also specifically using prebiotics to help offset some of the, the um, damaging effects of, of such diets of you know, starving out certain bacterial species. So, so prebiotic substances will, will help offset some of the, the potential consequences. What are some of the now, most important prebiotic what are some of the most important prebiotic uh, supplements to take or products to take? Yeah, no, I think the ones that make up the mainstay of my clinical practice would be um, lactulose and partially hydrolyzed guar gum, galacto oligosaccharides, and also a combination of inulin, which is a long chain fructo oligosaccharide, and then oligofructose, which is a short chain 
fructo oligosaccharide. So you can get a combination of both both those. So I use all four of them a lot in practice, but I they, they all have different effects. They'll have and some overlapping effects, but there'd be nuances about when you would use one over another and certain populations will, will cope well with one, but not cope well necessarily with another. So for those of us um, who are familiar with, uh, especially functional medicine practitioners, who are familiar with treating patients with irritable bowel syndrome caused by small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, we're used to having the patient take a lactulose breath test and then um, if yeah. that test comes back positive for hydrogen or methane gas, then, um, then we're gonna put them on a specific program to reduce the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, but the last thing that most of us would consider doing is using lactulose since lactulose is responsible for um, causing those gases to be produced that cause the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome like abdominal discomfort and gas and bloating and, and diarrhea and constipation, et cetera. So it's surprising to hear that you say that uh, ingesting lactulose is actually a good thing. Yeah, I can, un I can understand your, your thinking of that one. And it's interesting interesting for me because I started researching this area back in, I started doing my literature review for my honors degree back in 1999. So I came across lactulose as a prebiotic, you know, it used to be added to infant formula as a prebiotic. And we know clearly it meets the definition that it selectively feeds a certain number of beneficial bacteria, but it like bifidobacteria, for example, lactobacilli, uh, fecalobacterium, but it does indeed increase hydrogen gas production. Um, which then can either be converted to methane in some people or just stays as hydrogen in others and hence can be used as, as breath testing. And if you follow that, that the, the history of the lactulose breath test back, it used to be used as a marker of um, gut transit time from mouth to cecum. So that's where it was used for a long time before it was patented as a, as a, as a tool to investigate SIBO, it was used for an oral cecal transit time test um, until people started questioning because lactulose itself has got the capacity to speed up small bowel transit time um, which I, I use it for as a therapeutic tool, um, th then th that suggested that it's not actually necessarily all that accurate because in some people who take it, it speeds up the action and the, the fermentation is actually occurring in the colon, not the small bowel, even at the sort of 90 minute mark or even potentially at the 60 minute mark in some people. So to add a bit of further confusion in there, but if you step back and go, okay, well, actually this has got a, a long history of use as a prebiotic substance. Um, yes, there'll be some people who, who react to it with a tremendous amount of, of, of gas and symptoms, people who've got SIBO, look, some people who've got IBS and not SIBO, who also react to it with, with bloating and distension and, and pain. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other people who don't have those conditions who actually get the benefits of taking lactulose. I mean, I've used lactulose as a tool to decrease recurrent ur urinary tract infections for, for 15 years, and there's clinical trials showing that ingestion of lactulose reduces the risk of recurrent UTIs. And it does that by decreasing E. coli counts in the gut. Most Urinary tract infections are caused by E. coli, and the E. coli is making the journey from anus to vagina to urethra. So we know that lactulose decreases E. coli counts in the gut at a certain dose by about 100 fold. So that means there's 100 times less bacteria able to make that journey. It works as a clinical tool. It works for candida infections as well. There's other research showing a 97% reduced candida count in, in the, well, this was a, a in vitro study called a SHIME, the simulator of the human intestinal microbial environment, <laughs> SHIME study, but there's a 97% reduction in candida within 24 hours of introduction of lactulose due to its prebiotic actions. So I think it's got a range of actions um, and benefits that some people won't really get to derive the benefits from if they have certain gut conditions. But I do often use lactulose in SIBO patients too, but just SIBO patients who don't respond negatively to lactulose, and there are some that too. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, I heard you speak on somebody else's podcast, the uh, SIBO doctor podcast, that you typically, when you have a patient uh, you suspect of SIBO, you'll do the glucose, fructose, and lactulose breath tests. Yeah, because, because we know lactulose is selectively fermented. It's not going to be eaten by Klebsiella, it's not going to be eaten by E. coli, it's not going to be eaten by Bacteroides. If those are the bugs that are present in, in the small bowel, and we have good research showing those bugs off and off, are. It's not going to come up with the rise with, with lactulose. You just won't get it. Um, and, and it's been a, 
enjoy, enjoyable pro learning process in fact doing those three tests on so many patients now that I'll see no rise in lactulose, but I'll see a rise on fructose or a rise in glucose at the 20 minute mark or 15 minute mark or 30 or 45 minute mark. So clearly it's happening in the small bowel, um, but, the, but the bugs that are present don't eat lactulose. And that's a situation where I would use lactulose as a therapeutic tool to speed up the small bowel transit time and also to alter the, the environment of the small bowel to, to one that's less conducive to the growth of bacteroides, E. coli and Klebsiella, for example, because they don't like a, an acidic pH in general, and lactulose has got a good capacity to, when it's fermented by beneficial bugs, to change the pH to one that's more acidic and less conducive to their growth. Very interesting. You know, when, when people discuss what percentage of patients with IBS have SIBO, there's this big range, some of the studies show 40%, 70%. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, most of the doctors, functional medicine practitioners I know in the United States, especially in, in Los Angeles, uh, we pretty much just do the lactulose testing. And uh, I wonder if um, we're missing a lot of patients by not doing the glucose and the fructose testing as well. Well, I'd suggest the data says that you are. <laughs> yes. Interesting. That there's one study that was done comparing, like they had, they would have scoped down there, made sure these people did have SIBO, and then they gave them the different tests. And it turns out that I think lactulose was only able to discern one third of those people that actually had SIBO. And I think when you understand that lactulose is selectively fermented and not all bugs have got the right machine to break it down, wow. unlike glucose, in which all the bugs can eat glucose, that you get a, a, a much better accuracy by doing a spread of sugars. Um, and, and you also get a bit more of a nuanced answer about what bugs are there. Because if you have a raised glucose, but a flat line lactulose, you know the bugs that are there are bugs that can't eat lactulose, which probably means it's bugs like Bacteroides, E. coli, um, Klebsiella, for example. And then you could target your, your, or your herbal medicines, or if you use antibiotics, you could use them, target them a bit more specifically as well. Right. Interesting. Are there specific strains of probiotics that can be beneficial for treating patients with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Yeah, yeah, I think I think there is. And I think there's a number of ways that probiotics can be can be helpful. And, and this, again, is one of those areas that I think there's a lot of mythology out there. Um, that's been around for, for a while, which I think is starting starting to shift, thankfully. But if you start looking at what actions that different probiotic strains can have, it, and how they could benefit potentially people with SIBO. You've got the capacity to, to improve the migrating motor complex or, or improve motility. You've got the capacity to heal a, a damaged leaky gut. Um, some strains will work as selective antimicrobials. You've got the, the capacity to reduce visceral hypersensitivity, which we know is a key factor underlying irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and certainly some people with SIBO have got that same issue. There's are some strains that can decrease uh, intestinal inflammation and others that can up um, secretory IgA production in the gut, and secretory IgA is one of our you know, main immune factors for, I suppose, keeping bug counts a little bit lower than what they otherwise would be. Um, so enhancing that production can be another helpful tool. So I think there's a number of ways probiotics can be helpful. And then when you start looking at the literature about what studies have been done, the vast majority of studies have actually shown positive results for using um, you know, probiotics in um, SIBO. Now, the thing about probiotics, which you hinted to at the very beginning with the intro, is that in the actions are strain specific because the lactose cassia CRL431 has got the capacity to, to decrease you know, bug counts in the small bowel. It does not mean that another strain of L cassii has got the same capacity. Um, that's the reality of it. So you've really got to match the, the, the probiotic strains that we know work um, to the condition that you're wanting to treat to get the best results. So which ones work for SIBO? Can you give us some particulars and, and, and the product yeah, names so, certainly that, that so see come out? This makes it slightly more, more tricky in that the, so a lot of the combinations that are available for SIBO aren't commonly available in Canada, the US, or Australia, where most of your listeners and, and my patients actually dwell. <laughs> I know, I look at the literature too and go, like, if, I, if I knew there's a clinical trial showing you know, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial showing a combination helped deal with SIBO, I would probably, if I was a company, try to get those strains and come up with a new, new product showing work and bring it to the North American market. But some people have been a bit slow off the mark with that one, in my opinion. You know, so there's a combination of the CRL431 strain of lactose cassii and the CRL730 strain of acidophilus, which have been lactobacillus acidophilus, to be more exact, um, which have been shown to, to be effective um, in, in a well-designed clinical trial for, for, for treating SIBO, for example. So that one is not currently available. 
there's a combination found in Argentina called Bioflora, um, which had, I think, 82% reduction in symptoms, you know, SIBO-based symptoms, versus the control, which was um, Flagyl, which had a 52% reduction in symptoms. Wait a minute. Symptoms. What was the percentage reduction in symptoms? 82% with 82%. the probiotic combination versus wow. 52%. Yeah, with 52% with Flagyl, which was, you know, the antibiotic comparison. Yeah, wow. but again, if you live in Argentina, you can get that combination. Uh, as far as professional aware, supplement brands like Metagenics, are you guys listening? <laughs> Let's grab some of these strains and make them available. Yeah, and the, yeah, and there is one strain that's a commercial available in Italy and has been for a long time, which is uh, Bacillus clausii strain, and it's sold as Enterogamina. Uh, and there's a 30-day clinical trial that found a 47% eradication rate of SIBO. You know, so which is still a you know pretty impressive outcome. Yeah. Um, based on that's all you're doing, and there's no dietary changes, there's wow. nothing else, it's just the probiotic administration. And again, that's available in Italy um, for those lucky Italians with SIBO, but but it's not so easily available for us. Yeah, and there was one very cool study with probably the best results I've seen yet, which was actually a Jap uh, Chinese study, but the, the description of what they used was amazingly poor. They called it like bifidobacteria triple viable capsule, no dose, no species, let alone strain details, but it did have an 81% eradication rate of placebo versus 25% of placebo. So, you know, good results, but we can't actually implement it in a, in a practical level because we don't know what was used in that particular supplement, but it adds to that body of knowledge that, that probiotics can be very helpful clinical tools. Now, I heard you mention a particular strain that was beneficial for methane um, SIBO, which is particularly difficult to treat. Um, can you tell us about that? Yes, so that was a, that, and that one is commercially available, thank goodness. So that one is Lactobacillus reuteri DSM17938, which is otherwise known as the BioGaia strain, which might be an easier way to remember it than its, its numeric code name. Um, and the BioGaia preparation is available in Canada, the US, and Australia as, as probiotic drops or, or lozenges in a few different forms. Now, there is a recent study, so just, just published in the last few months, looking at methane, um, people who are constipated, so functional constipation with high methane loading. And we've known for a number of years that this particular strain is helpful for functional constipation that increases number of bowel movements per week. But there was an Italian research team that sort of tried to piece together, how is it doing that? Is, is it working by decreasing methane output? And yes, it turns out that it did. So in this particular study, relatively small study, I think there was about 20 people in the study, but they still found that after four weeks administration that, that methane, uh, overall methane, production decreased by nearly two thirds and the 55% uh, of subjects did not produce methane at the end of the four week trial versus the, that did at the beginning. And on, on top of that, they're doing an extra two bowel movements per week, you know, so it's, it's, you know, going from four to six point something. So, you know, it, it seemed to be working probably via that, that mechanism. Now, whether that, I mean, that particular strain of, 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 Reutri is somewhat unique in its capacity to, to produce an antimicrobial substance called reuterin that not all other strains of, of re, lactose reuteri can produce, only some can. Um, and that might be how it's actually working. So, so we don't necessarily know exactly how it's suppressing Methanobriver, Methanobriverbacter, but we know it does have the capacity to do so. And this is one of the, the you know, few human clinical trials on non-antibiotic treatments for, for methane essentially methane overgrowth or overproduction of methane in the gut. Wow, amazing. So a probiotic that actually has an antimicrobial effect other than just crowding out the other bacteria because some of them work that way as well. Yes, yeah. And, and the more you look at probiotic mechanisms of action, you can see that they work in a much broader way. There's even some probiotics that decrease um, you know, pathogenic gene um, exhibition by, by certain virulent strains of, of, of bacteria, you know, so that they working, can work by a number of different ways. But, you know, we don't know whether this one did it through through um, changing the environment so it's a bit more acidic, but I, th I think it's probably that might be part of the picture because Methenib River Bacter smithii sort of likes growing at a more neutral pH and doesn't really like an acidic environment. Um, but my theory is that it may well have been due to the retrin, which is a, 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 you know, a potent antimicrobial compound produced by the BioGaia strain of lactose retrin. 
Um, you mentioned that there are particular strains that can promote uh, GI motility and or the uh, migrating motor complex, which is uh, part of the uh, mechanism by which uh, SIBO occurs. What Can you tell us about those? Yeah, yeah, certainly the, there's two different strains of bifidobacterium lactis that have shown capacity to speed, you know, um, but whole gut transit time, so from you know mouth to to toilet bowl, essentially, and that's if I'm turning lactis DN one seven three zero one zero, which is only available worldwide in a one brand of yogurt called Activia. Um, sadly, because um, I've looked at the Activia ingredient list for you know, for North Americans, and it's <laughs> not not ideal, not so clean, and I think I'd have, have hesitation recommending my patients to consume such a thing myself. Um, so in Australia, I, I was lucky they used to have a, a Greek um, non-flavored one that actually the ingredient list was, was quite quite okay, uh, and, and it did, did actually work really well for my functional constipated patients, um, with, which was great because it's a pretty easy easy um, thing just have change the brand of yogurt they're eating, and all of a sudden the you know the transit time goes from you know 48 hours down to 21 hours massive shift in even wow. just a two-week time period um but that strain is only available at, in that that brand of yogurt um sadly and another strain of, of bifidobacterium lactis hn019 which is commercially available in a number of brands in australia and, and in america as well you know for a while it was only available in, in like the zymogen brand in the u.s so certainly that, that brand has been widely used because it's got a decent amount of that specific strain in it. Um, and, and again, you're looking at, you know, the clinical trials showed that one, there was a dose response. So a higher dose had a, had a greater effect than a lower dose. But secondly, that, you know, the whole gut transit time decreased from, you know, 40, 50 hours down to the, the low twenties, just after two weeks of ingestion. So it's a pretty massive shift. And, and for me, they, they are core aspects of, of particularly my, my, um, slow gut transit time SIBO patients of using probiotics as prokinetics. Uh, wow. Which I think the research says actually works and my clinical experience tells me it tends to work too. And there's been one study, an animal study using a combination of lactobacillus rhamnosus GG and bifidobacterium lactis BB12 in combination showing it actually increased the, the migrating motor complex sort of cleansing waves as well. So we've got some data there, but so far only an animal study. Great. I mean, it's my understanding that anything that would increase GI motility, um, if you take it at night when you haven't eaten for a long time and you're not going to eat for hours, would have the same effect on the migrating motor complex. Yeah, it would be interesting because they didn't look necessarily at the specifics of how it happened. We do, you know, the mechanism by which it does it. We know it does it. Um, does it do it in every single patient? Sadly not. <laughs> I wish there was an intervention that worked in every single patient, but right. reality is it's not. Um, but it does do it in a lot of patients, you know, and 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 you get not only just SIBO patients, but people with functional constipation. Sometimes it's as simple as giving them the right probiotic strain with effort with you know def define definite evidence of efficacy for that scenario, and it works. You know, and they don't necessarily, and, and then you can still work on improving the, their their background diet and the lifestyle that may have contributed to their slow gut transit time in the first place. Great. Um, are there uh, particular strains of probiotics that can help to heal a leaky gut? Yeah, and, and I think we'll see more and more research coming out. There's been probably a fair bit of animal research done. Um, my, you know, I prefer using human studies when I, when I can to support my prescriptions. And the, the one strain that has probably the best evidence for, for healing up damaged gut is the Saccharomyces cerevisiae variety Bilardii biocodex, or also known as the Lyo strain, which has got good evidence showing its capacity to return small bowel architecture to normal um, and heal leaky gut when it's been damaged. And the study was done the one I can think of was done in, in kids that had Giardia, and they had, um, Giardia was treated, but they had chronic ongoing diarrhea and villus flattening. You know, so rather than these beautiful villi, they had flattening. And they gave them this, this, the, the right Saccharomyces and then had a, put a scope down there afterwards, and most kids actually had a return of normal architecture to the small bowel. So it's got a great capacity to speed it up. And as a clinician that you know, does some pre and post tests, pre and post testing for leaky gut, it does does work well. So that's my, my preparation choice for, for healing up a damaged leaky gut. Interesting. So that could probably potentially be beneficial for a patient with a parasite as well. 
Yes, and the, and the, certainly there's been a number of studies using that same Saccharomyces supplement alongside antibiotics to treat Giardia um, and Entamoeba, and it actually improves eradication rate dramatically. So, so yes, it improves eradication. Also, it, it actually helps heal up, heal up the damage that's caused afterwards. So, very much so. Wow, that's awesome. Um, I heard you talk about, can you explain how uh, Saccharomyces boulardii was uh, first discovered? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting story, actually. And essentially, it was, it was a French microbiologist, Henri Goulard, who, who was traveling in the Indochina area, which we probably call Thailand, or thereabouts now. And there was an outbreak of, of cholera, and, and people were getting very, very sick all around him. But he noticed that there were some people making a, a, a preparation after the skin of, of lychees and also of mangosteens, which are both, you know, tropical fruit, and delicious tropical fruit, I might add. But they're making, you know, medicines out of uh, essentially tea out of the skins of these, those fruit. And the people who were drinking this weren't getting sick and or were getting better. So he had his microbiology hat on, obviously. So he was like, okay, I wonder if there's a microbe in, in, on the skin of lychees that's actually contributing to, to the, the treatment or the prevention of, of cholera in this case. Now, it's interesting for me as, as a, someone who's a, as a, as an herbalist, I'd be looking at, you know, what, what compounds are in the, the skin of the, the lychee or the um, mangosteen that are actually causing the change in diarrhea, but because he had his micro hat on, that's what he looked for. Isolated a, a, a yeast from, from the skin, which he then named after himself. We knew it was a Saccharomyces, so we called it Saccharomyces boulardii, boulard, boulardii. And essentially, he, he, he took that back and commercialized it. So, so I think it's been sold as a probiotic supplement from you know, the 1940s onwards in Europe. And, and now there's, there's you know, that same, the Boulard AI. Um, well, now the, the, the name has changed because we now know that it's actually within the same species as Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is just normal baker's yeast. But it's a, it's a unique organism within that, that, that species. So we now call it Saccharomyces. I see Cerviaceae variety Bilardii, um, and, ah, and it's the biocodex preparation that, that has been used, because he sold it to a company in France called Biocodex, and they've been selling it from the 1940s or 50s onwards, and pretty much 95% of the research done on, on Saccharomyces, so-called Bilardii, has been done on that exact biocodex preparation. There's been very little done on other versions. Interesting, and it is... Um... I, my understanding is, is among the other benefits of Saccharomyces, uh, one of the benefits is in treating uh, yeast or fungal overgrowth. Is that correct? Yeah, it does have a capacity to, to suppress the growth of a bug like candida and other sort of intestinal yeasts. You know, it's been a number of clinical trials for antibiotic associated diarrhea in terms of having to pre prevent it, some research on colostrum still infections as well, and that particular strain has got the capacity to even break down um, Clostridium difficile toxins as well, which, which, may, which is somewhat unique. Um, right, yes, yes, yes. Also some research in Crohn's disease and also research in ulcerative colitis, it's, 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 and even some neural bowel syndrome. So there's a number of studies looking at that, that, that particular strain, and it does seem to have a wide spread of actions, but I think a lot of it does go down to, to you know, improving the ecosystem in the gut, but because it does seem to have that capacity to and helping to, to restore a healthy ecosystem after antibiotics more quickly. There's some very good research on that. Um, but importantly, to, to heal a damaged gut, you know, because as you, you would know, and as functional medicine practitioners would know, that the leaky gut contributes to most Western diseases that we see, even things, simple things like obesity, um, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, we now know are linked to leaky gut and increased absorption of endotoxins. So, you know, things that inc improve or speed up healing of, of um, damaged gut are going to have a range of, of flow on health benefits for people. Interesting. Um, so Saccharomyces is beneficial for um, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, are there other uh, probiotics that are beneficial for treating those inflammatory bowel conditions or would Saccharomyces be the best well, one to use? Well, this is for, for Crohn's, it's been, it's been a bit hit and miss in all honesty in that the most research on probiotics and Crohn's has been disappointing. Uh, um, Saccharomyces is the only one that has shown some degree of efficacy fairly consistently. Um, in the most recent study, which is the, the biggest study and the best designed study, interestingly enough, it didn't work in the whole, whole group population, but it did work in non-smokers. Um, so some people who don't smoke, 
there was a 78% redu reduction in, um, I think it was flare-ups in people that took the Saccharomyces. If you did smoke, it didn't seem to actually make much difference. So, um, but yeah, but that seems to have the best evidence, whereas most other strains had actually failed in Crohn's so far. But for things like ulcerative colitis, I think the data has been um, more consistently positive for a wide range of strains so that you could have like the combination VSL number three has got some evidence for preventing pouchitis um, infections, but also for, for you know, um, inducing remission in people that were <clears throat> having a hard time gaining remission when their disease was in a flare. You've got lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, which has been used to maintain remission. In fact, this, one particular study, they used it, um, compared it to mesalazine in its capacity to keep people in, with ulcerative colitis in remission, and LDG actually worked better then. So, so I think we've got that particular strain I often use in my ulcerative colitis patients and those who are in remission, but I will sometimes use bugs like VSL, combinations like VSL number three to help induce remission. And there's also some, some research on E. coli Nisla 1917, that one specific variety of E. coli, helping people to go into remission um, with ulcerative colitis as well. But it tends to be, it's available for me here in Australia, and I think sadly not so easy for you guys in, in America. Um, but it is a, a moderately expensive supplement, so it may not be my first port of call. I might go with with LG, you know, LGG first first off, and then if it doesn't work, use the Nissel 1917. Interesting. I heard uh, Dr. Sidney Baker talk about the use of actually parasites um, uh, for treating inflammatory bowel disorders. Um, what do you know about the potential use of uh, parasites as, and, you know, um, most people think of probiotics as bacteria, but we've been talking about Saccharomyces, which is a, uh, a, a form of yeast that's a probiotic and, and, and there are also parasites. Yeah. Isn't that correct? There is. It's, and that's a little bit outside my area of, of expertise. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm familiar with a bit with the research generally. Um, and I think it looks like a potentially promising treatment. Um, in, 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 some, in some research studies. I mean, I think there's also promising research looking at fecal microbial transplants, which are, right. perhaps are more up my alley. I, my, my alley, I'm much more um, open to, to inject, you know, people actually getting other people's, you know, fecal transplant than I am probably for, for getting other sort of worm species in there. But from an evolutionary perspective, I can understand that, you know, we would have probably always had intestinal worms as part of our ecosystems up until relatively recently. And I think right. that's part of that, you know, the hygiene hypothesis aspect is we're, we're missing some certain, you know, um, travelers like parasites that, that, that may actually help keep some of those diseases in check. And in a similar way, you know, um, Martin Blazer put forth the idea of the, you know, disappearing microbiota hypothesis that, that, you know, over the last few generations, um, particularly Westerners, we've lost a lot, if not most of our, our microbiota. So, so we're missing a number of species that, that may well have been playing protective roles against developing conditions like C. Vac disease or ulcerative colitis or Crohn's because those things were not particularly common 50, 60 years ago, but they're, they're much more common now. And you know, genes haven't changed in that time. Environment has, food has, um, and certainly the combination of environment and, and food on our gut has changed things a lot. Right. Um, so it's become very popular to uh, recommend um, soil-based probiotics and now spore-based probiotics. What do you think about the value of those types of probiotics? Is there I enough think, data to really recommend them? You can't put, um, well, for me, it's like, I can't make a recommendation on a, on a whole class of, of probiotics at, at this juncture because you know, my soil, I can go dig it in my garden here in, in Tasmania, will have different microbes in the soil somewhere else. And to assume that they're gonna do the same thing just because they're found in soil, I think is, is um, illogical. And, and I think I, that's one of the things, issues I've, I've got with some of the things of going, okay, well, you know, it's almost like this, this idea that, that humans were born sterile, that we ate dirt, then we were colonized. Uh, and it's not the way it worked, you know, all animals have got microbiota and, and passed on through, through evolutionary, you know, pathways from, from, you know, mother to next generation, that whole sort of way along. Um, yeah, and, and I think there's probably not enough research done on specific preparations for me to feel wholly comfortable recommending them as a, as a full stop thing, particularly when there's uh, is good research on other, other probiotic preparations derived from lactobacilli and bifidobacteria. And I'm certainly not anti using strains that are found that, that didn't aren't in those genera or aren't naturally found in the human gut. 
um, I'm okay with that as long as there's research showing that they're one safe and two efficacious, you know, so I'm unwilling to experiment with something that, that doesn't have that, 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 that sort of data set. And I'm happy to see that that, that research is, is growing. And there is some like that enterogamina preparation in Italy has got a, you know, a decent amount of research on it. It's certainly very safe and used for a long period of time, helpful for certain conditions, no doubt. But I don't think we can assume because that peak of strain is that other strains will, will, will Will have the same sort of efficacy, or even within the same species, let alone different different actual species alt altogether. Um, yes, and then sometimes I think there's sort of some places that are promoting soil-based and, and spore-based ones, putting uh, misinformation about the lack of efficacy of, of standard probiotics, and, and I, I think that's poor form too. That you don't need to to, to try to to put down your competition to make your product look better. I think you can just make your product look good because there's good research on it showing it works. Because we have ample data showing that the number of probiotics from the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria camps and saccharomyces actually have therapeutic effects. Um, and you can't ignore all the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials and meta-analyses suggesting that they actually work and have, have benefit. Interesting. So um, let me just ask you one final question. Um, is there a real therapeutic value for practitioners to send a patient for a stool test, um, look at, you know, especially, you know, one of the functional medicine stool tests that looks at the balance of the commensal and, and, and all the different bacteria and the colon, you know, the whole, try to get a sense of the whole microbiome and then looking at which species are low and trying to uh, particularly supplement those to create a balance and, um, also, there's a lot of discussion um, that when you analyze the microbiome, you want to have more diversity of species, and you also want to have this proper ratio of firmicutes to bacteroides. Is there a lot of therapeutic value in tinkering with the microbiome in that way? Personally, I think there's a tremendous amount. Um, I, I use fecal uh, microbiome reanalysis with, with most of my patients. You know, I've been in clinical practice for, as you said before, 17 years. And, and these days I, I would only rely on, um, to really assess the health of the microbiota, you need to use molecular techniques that can tell you more than, you can't tell how healthy your system is from looking at four different species or six different species, like just looking at bifidobacteria, E. coli, streptococci, isn't enough to tell you what's going on. Um, you, you need a, a a test that can actually assess things like diversity, because that is an important value that we should be assessing. And you need one that can look at a whole bunch of, of anaerobes that we can't grow in, 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 we can't culture, like Fecalobacterium, Acromansia, Eubacterium, Roseburia, um, and Testobacter, Subdolagranium. There's a number of species that are key butyrate producers that we, we can't grow. So I think there's, if you're using the right tests, you can tell a tremendous amount of information. And, and from that, you can actually come up with a whole range of interventions that can be, be helpful. But I think there's challenges with, with relying on older technologies like culturing to try to assess the health of the microbiota. Yes, it can tell us about pathogens. That's great. I'm totally up for that. But it, if, if they can't tell us about the health of the ecosystem, they can't tell us about diversity, because diversity is, is a measure of how many species are present. And if you're looking for six species, you can't tell what the other 80 or 90 or 100 species are actually like and what population dynamics there are, because diversity is a marker of two things. One is the number of species present, but also the spread. Um, and you're not going to get that for any culture-based test technique. Um, so yes, a, a molecular technique that tells you the whole picture can tell you tremendous amounts of data, uh, and including about you know, pathobionts like uh, the sulfovibrio and, and bilophila that are essentially bile, bile acid eaters that we can't grow in culture. And those bugs go up on, on typical high fat diets. Um, and we need to know that if that's actually happening with particular patients. And for me, this is an important thing. And I, I run workshops for practitioners so working through the, or become more comfortable with the molecular techniques because it's something that most of us weren't trained in. It's new technology, a whole bunch of new species that we're not even aware of. Um, that we weren't taught about that actually do play key roles and there's still species being discovered that we have no idea what they do yet, but we know that they're actually there. Um, but, but I think the, the benefit of that is working on how to change lifestyle, how to change diet, how to use prebiotics to really alter the ecosystem. Because if you're low in, in bifidobacteria, yes, you can supplement bifidobacteria and whilst they're taking that supplement, it's gonna show up as being a decent amount on that stool test. But as soon as they stop, it's gonna go down. 
So if I know that they're low in bifidobacteria, I'm going to go, okay, what prebiotics can I get them to, to, to use? What prebiotic-rich foods can I get them to take? What prebiotic-like foods can I get them to eat and drink daily to, to nurture their endogenous populations? Um, but we're also looking at, at B-trade producers like Fecalobacterium and Roseburia, a new bacterium and Ruinococci that, again, we can work out with the low, what foods that we need more of to nurture them. And I think that is the strongest data that's there, is using prebiotics and dietary and lifestyle factors to alter diversity, increase levels of, of beneficial bugs rather than using probiotics, which really in an intact ecosystem um, actually have a limited capacity to alter things. They can do some tweaks to it, but they're nowhere near as strong as changing diet and using prebiotics, which can cause massive shifts in the ecosystem. And using molecular um, analysis techniques, you can see that clearly in your own patients, in yourself as well. It's harder to see with the, with the old technology. So um, are there particular- in terms of the Formicides bacteroidetes ratio, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, it's a delay again. The yeah. Formicides bacteroidetes ratio, when research first came out, looking at that ratio back in 2005, 2006, et cetera, it seemed like it was, it was an important ratio to actually be focused on. Now, I think there's been a number of research studies done over the last, published over the last five years or so suggesting otherwise. So, so I don't particularly think there's a huge amount of, um, imp the data is not there to put a huge focus on the, the Formicides bacteroidetes ratio now. Um, I think what's more important is looking at, yes, levels of bacteroidetes per se, look, looking at levels of proteobacteria per se, because those are both bugs that contain lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin. And some people will have, you know, those bugs who make up 20% of the ecosystem, sometimes they'll make up 70, 80% of what's there. And that means 80% of your gut bugs are endotoxin rich, which is, which is problematic and certainly very pro-inflammatory. So knowing those sort of breakdown, bigger phyto level data is important, but then also knowing levels of more specific species like, um, Fecalobacterium and Acromantia that, you know, as well as Bifidobacteria that are really, you know, gut guardian species, very protective species that are, are really important to know about. Interesting. All right, so you had a question that I think leading to um, what, what tests, what lab tests you can actually yes. use now. Now, for North Americans, you've got people like the American Gut Project, you've got Ubiome that can give you that sort of sort of data. Um, there's Genova GIFX stool profile that uses, uses some molecular techniques too. They only look at, I think, 24 different species, but a lot of those are, are important key players, so you still get a lot of lot of, lot of data there. Um, whereas you get a, a much fuller picture with Ubiome or um, American Gut Project. Awesome. Well, this was a, a amazing discussion. I thank you so much for joining us today, Jason, Dr. Herlick. Um, uh, for um, patients and practitioners uh, who'd like to get a hold of you or who'd like to sign up um, for your uh, probiotic advisor. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you or to, and also to find out Certainly about the probiotic the, advisor? Sorry. Yeah, the probiotic advisor, if you even just, that's right. If you just Google probiotic advisor, it'll come up and there's, there's certainly for practitioners, there's a chance to give a 24 hour spin trial for free. So have a play around and have a look. I just urge people to watch. There's a little video that goes for five minutes telling people how to get the best, most use out of it. So, so if people do that, they tend to find it easier to, to play around with from that point onwards. Um, the database is always increasing in, in size, adding new products um, and adding new research, which is always exciting because things change on a weekly basis these days with the probiotic field. Now for, for patients, I do practice in, in, in clinic. Um, the clinic is called Gould's Natural Medicine in, in Hobart, and I do offer respect appointments, etc. Um, again, that could be Googled, and then there's a contact form there for people who might be interested in, in seeing me in, in, in a patient context. That's great. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us.